Good afternoon. Good to see all of you here today. We invite you to turn to Romans 9 in your Bibles. Follow along as I read verses 6 through 13. Romans 9, 6 through 13. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. The title is Election Biblical. Is Election Biblical? In our last study of Romans, we began a new section in the book of Romans, chapters 9 through 11. And in the first five verses of that chapter, we noted, first of all, Paul's burden for the salvation of souls, in particular, his Jewish people, his kindred people after the flesh. We also mentioned that chapters 9 through 11 are not disconnected from chapters 1 through 8, as some commentators believe, but are closely connected. God's focus is on the individual and his salvation in chapters 1 through 8, and moves to the salvation of national Israel in chapters 9 through 11. And thirdly, that Paul answered his detractors' accusations that he was a traitor because he was turning his back on his people. <clears throat> he was turning his back on his own Jewish people, they accused him of. And so he wrote, demonstrating that God has not cast away his people whom he has foreknown. And we'll look at that in the coming uh, weeks. And then lastly, we noticed in chapters 9 through 11 that God brings together all his purposes for his people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and everything else he's going to do in the future with his people. And therefore God harmonizes in these chapters his purposes and justifies himself in his relationship with his people in the past, in the present, and in the future. That's the overriding thought in the book of Romans, and that is what connects the first eight chapters with chapters 9, 10, and 11. So with this backdrop, we now come to verses 6 to 13, in which we hope to answer the question, is election biblical? Well, I will respond immediately with the answer, yes it is. Of course. Why? Well, because it's in the Bible. Very simple. The doctrine of election is clearly taught in the Bible. Now, I know that there are some people who don't like the doctrine of election, and there are various reasons why they don't. Some don't like it because they don't have a say in the matter of their destiny. If God sovereignly chooses who will be saved, they don't want any part of it because they don't want to have God completely in control. They feel some innate, intangible desire to, to hold on to a little part of their destiny. At least maybe they can give God the final word through their will and allow God to save them. So some people don't like election because it makes them feel helpless, like God is sovereignly and totally in control of their life. Others don't like election because they've been jaded by teachers who taught them an unscriptural view of election. And still others simply are ignorant and don't understand election because they've never either 
heard of the doctrine before, or if they have, they didn't hear very much about it and therefore don't understand it. Nevertheless, you must have some position on election because the Bible teaches it, and whatever the Bible teaches, God wants you to understand it for His glory and for your benefit. Everything that God wrote in the Bible is for our edification. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? The things which were written before time were written for your admonition, for your edification, for your growth. And also, everything in the Bible gives us a broad and comprehensive picture of the nature of God himself. The more we learn of doctrine, the more that picture, that mosaic, will fill in with the, the beautiful color of God's truth, the very nature of God himself. And so the Bible is, is full of doctrines that point us to God himself and help us to understand what he is like, who he is, and, it, and therefore it in, this understanding enriches our worship experience. And so whatever the Bible teaches, God wants you to understand it, like I said, for his glory and benefit. And therefore, it behooves each and every one of us to find out the correct view the Bible's position on election. For example, the, in, in terms of the Bible teaching election, I'll just give you a sampling of dozens and dozens of verses where either the word elect or election or predestined or predestinated is found. In Romans 8, 29, we already looked at this. For whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. Ephesians 1.11, and if you are acquainted with where the books are located in the Bible in relationship to the other books, you'll be able to turn quickly. And we do encourage you to turn to verses as you're able to in your Bible. And I know sometimes when I spout them off very quickly, it's kind of hard to do that. And one of the reasons in our Tuesday night Bible study, we're memorizing all the books of the Bible, all 66 books, not the content, but the the books itself, themselves in order, is so we can find certain passages very quickly. Ephesians 1.11, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. 2 Peter 1.10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. And then, fourthly, Colossians 3.12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. And lastly, 1 Peter 1.2, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Just a small sample of dozens and dozens of verses containing these words, pointing us to the doctrine of election. And it's important for the people to, of God to know, not only that they are elect, and that is the reason why they became saved, but there's, there's much more in this doctrine than just the knowledge that I'm chosen. There is a, a spiritual wealth of truth connected with election that motivates and inspires and drives our service to God, or of God, our worship, our relationship with one another. In a very small form, I experienced this as a young boy growing up in the Jewish religion. All the time I would hear when I went to temple, when I was in the classes, the, the, the learning about the Jewish religion. For six years I went to Hebrew school uh, until I went to the Bar Mitzvah at age 13. And the teachers would teach us how to read and write Hebrew. They would teach us the history of Israel. But constantly, this word chosen would come up. And by the time I was 13 years old, if I didn't know much about Judaism, I knew one thing. I was a special person. Why? Because I was chosen. I'm Jewish. And I was chosen. I'm a chosen person. Now that can be abused. <laughs> And it was abused by me because after I graduated high school and went off the deep end and got involved in sin, uh, I thought that I was insulated from going to hell because I was one of the chosen. All I had to be was of the physical seed or race of Abraham, and that, that gave me a ticket to heaven. And you know, the same kind of reasoning goes on in the church too. There are many church members 
who say, well, because I'm chosen, I can pretty much do what I want. I've got a ticket to ride. I've got a ticket to heaven. But I think our consciences will kick in because the law of God is written in our hearts and bear witness that when we sin, if we're not converted, uh, that certainly such a lifestyle will not lead to heaven, but to hell. Well then, with that backdrop, let's look at Romans 9.6. In the first place then, election and God's purpose, Romans 9, 6. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Now what we want to talk about here is God's purpose in election. And someone will say, well this is very important, this is a very serious issue. Because if God made promises to Israel as his chosen people, that they are his chosen people, how can this truth be reconciled with Israel's rejection by God and God's judgment upon them? And then the Gentiles being brought into the place of blessing, being brought in to the center stage. So is God's purpose derailed? Is God's purpose defeated in that, in the Old Testament, He called Israel to be His chosen people forever? It appears on the surface that God is defeated on this one point. That Israel blew it, they sinned against the Lord, they disobeyed God, they stoned the prophets, they crucified their own Messiah, and now God is washing His hands of Israel, and this idea of replacement theology would tend to be valid. That is, those who teach is that the church replaces Israel, and God no longer, ever again, from the cross forward, will have anything to do with Israel on a national basis. We call that replacement theology. Now, I don't embrace replacement theology. I know a famous radio Bible teacher that does, but I don't believe it because if you read Romans 11 very carefully and compare it with many texts, both in the Old and New Text Testament, you will clearly see that God has some kind of future purpose with Israel. We may not know all the particulars, but we know, as God himself has said, he has not cast away his people corporately whom he has foreknown. Now we'll flesh all that out. We'll get into the exegesis and <clears throat> the exposition and application of that uh, in a couple of chapters from now. But God's purpose is not defeated. God's purpose is never thwarted. God always accomplishes plan A. He has no plan B in waiting. There's nothing on the bench waiting to be called up if, if plan A doesn't work. You see, God is saying that here in verse 6, that he has never broken his promise to Israel. The failure of the Jews to respond to the gospel of Christ did not mean God's word failed. God always kept his promises to the nation of Israel. And he goes on to demonstrate in chapter 9 that he has always had a process of election taking place behind the scenes with respect to national Israel with respect to individual Jews and individual Gentiles. His, his doctrine, his truth, his purpose in election has never failed in the case of any one individual. All those that the Father determined to save either became saved or are in the process of becoming saved right now or will be saved in the future. His purpose with regard to election has never failed. And that's the key to understanding whether or not God's promise was kept regarding Israel. Just because a person, though, uh, he goes on to show uh, in verse 6, is born as a Jew in the nation of Israel doesn't mean he is an heir of the promise of God. 
which God has never failed, his promise to Israel and his promise to his people. Now, we need to remember, not, not as though the promise of God had entirely failed, hadn't failed at all, though Paul grieved over Israel's unbelief in verses 2 and 3 of Romans 9. He, he says he has great sorrow and continual grief in his heart. He could wish that he himself were a curse from Christ for his brethren, his countrymen according to the flesh. Um, we see Paul moaning and lamenting over Israel's blindness and their lost estate. But the promise of God to the Jewish people and their salvation has not fa failed, though he is deeply concerned for the spiritual welfare of the nation, that is Paul. Yet he's not saying that the whole nation is going to be destroyed just because he's concerned about their blindness. He's concerned that they've been cast away as God's representative people in the earth, as we read in the book of Hosea, foretelling Israel's great chastisement for the next 2,000 or 2,500 years since that prophecy in Hosea was written. But it's not a permanent prophecy where Israel will forever be cast away, will forever be punished for their unbelief and their sins. The promise of God will not entirely fail. God's promise will come back into fruition and be completed. Because within the nation of Israel, you must remember that God has preserved for himself a true believing remnant. Even during Israel's times of captivity, even when they were at their worst, crucifying the Messiah, killing the prophets, God still preserved for himself the 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal, that tiny remnant of true believers who were born from above. They were Jews according to the flesh, but they were also Jews in their heart. They were the people of God in the spirit. And God preserved them, even to this day, uh, so that among the diaspora, the scattered, dispersed Jews throughout the world, especially in certain concentrations in Western Europe and in New York and in America. We see a believing remnant of Jews. We have Jewish missionary groups like Jews for Jesus who are reaching out with the gospel to Jewish people. And some of them are coming to Christ, like myself. Turn with me to Romans 8, uh, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2. We have a critical passage of scripture, which is a commentary on Romans 9, 6, 7, and 8. Because at the end of verse 6 in Romans 9, it says, For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. That seems contradictory. What do you mean, they are not all Israel who are of Israel? Isn't Israel Israel? Yeah, Israel is Israel. But within the nation... God is not lumping everybody together as one kind or type of people. In Romans 2, 28 and 29, God makes a distinction within the nation of two different types of people. For he says in verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. In other words, the greater mark of the covenant, the greater evidence or trait of the covenant among the people was circumcision of the heart. And it had its beginning with Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation in Genesis 17. Yet the tragedy is that the Jews depended on the physical mark, the physical trait. They were more concerned about the outward identification with the nation, the culture, the Jewish tradition, the Jewish customs. And that's what I grew up in. Custom and tradition and ritual swallowed up all of the spiritual elements of their religion. And when I grew up as a Jew for the first 18 years of my life, not one time I heard, had I ever heard, as a Jew, 
that we could have a personal relationship with the living God. That we could know God in our heart. Not one time. There was no gospel. It was all tradition, custom, and ritual. Say this, do that, go there, give this, and you'll be fine. Do the best you can, and you'll make it. What is that? And no wonder why Paul was grieved. And in a, in a, a much smaller sense, as I think about this, this plight of blindness and deception among my own Jewish people, it grieves my heart. I've to this day witnessed to my mother for 37 years. My wife is a witness to this. She was there most of the times I shared the gospel with my mother. And the, 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 the gospel went in one ear and out the other. Because blindness in part has happened to Israel. But the veil is taken away in Christ. And when the Holy Spirit comes... To apply the work of Christ on the cross, who was sent to bring into fruition the electing, predestinating plan of the Father. Their eyes are open. The deaf ears can hear. And the deceived hearts are circumcised by the Spirit. God sent various warnings to Israel along these lines. That there are two different kinds of people within Israel. In Deuteronomy 10, 16, a gospel nugget was sent to them. He says, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Mm. He's pointing them to that inner realm where we need to be converted in our hearts, in our souls. In John 1.47, again, Jesus alluding to this, it says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Jesus looking past the outer man of which the Jews relished him to the inner man, looking into Nathanael's heart to see if his heart was circumcised. And he saw that he was a true believer in the Spirit. Not only was he a chosen one among the nation of Israel, but in his heart he was converted and born from above. So a true Jew is one who has an inward spiritual experience in the heart. And not merely an outward physical identity with a religion or an outward physical work-centered Relationship with a religion, thinking works will save you. No, people today make the same mistake with reference to baptism or the Lord's Supper or even church membership. If I can, if I can just take the Lord's Supper or be baptized or join the church, I'll be okay. But those can be, they can all be religious works that earn no one merit in the eyes of God. Just like the Jews thought if they just brought their offering to the temple, if they were just faithful to the external commandments, they'll be okay. You see, God judges according to the secrets of the heart we read in Romans 2.16 so that He's not impressed with mere outward formalities. An obedient Gentile with no circumcision would be more acceptable than a disobedient Jew with circumcision. This is what pastors are trying to get through to people in their inner man, in their heart of hearts, in the realm of the Spirit. To go past the external of your particular persuasion, your religion, or even within Christianity in general. Look past the unique ceremonies and rituals of your church, your denomination. Look to Christ. Because He alone can save. I'm not saying there's no value in symbols or ceremonies. If you're in the Spirit when you worship, they may enhance your worship experience. But grace and power do not proceed from external ceremonies or customs or rituals. Power proceeds 
from the person of God himself. Grace comes from Jesus Christ. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Number two, election and Abraham's descendants, verses 7 through 9a. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. Now I want to stop right here and make a quick point. I don't have time to elaborate on it. But I want to emphasize this because I think it's important. Those churches that raise their children in an atmosphere that is described as a covenant atmosphere. That is, it's taught or it's conveyed in, in the pulpit. That because you're a covenant child, or you're brought up in the church, there are special promises assigned to you. This, this passage destroys that. Mm. Absolutely destroys that. There, there is no external promise or privilege given to anyone, regardless of who they are or what their background is, apart from those promises which are given to us in the gospel. Amen. We are saved by grace through faith. Is there an advantage of being brought up in a Christian home? Yes. Is there an advantage of coming under the gospel week after week in a sermon or uh, at the feet of parents teaching their children the word of God as they train them in the fear and admonition of the Lord? Yes. Well, what good did all that training do to the Jewish nation? To me! I got the equivalent of perhaps a master's degree in those six years of Hebrew school. What good did it do me? Apart from the Spirit of the living God coming, being dispensed into my heart to apply, to make understandable, and to make desirable, those things which I learned from the Word of God, so that I sought the Lord until I found Him by faith in Jesus Christ. There are two meanings here in verses 7 through 9a to the word seed. And he repeats this word three times, but twice in a categorical sense. Notice verse 9a, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, that's the first category, then, in verse 8, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So there is the first seed with regard to the seed of Abraham, and then the second seed is that which is counted, uh, or the, the children of the promise are the second seed. Now, the, the first seed is given to us here in a natural sense, meaning a descendant after the flesh. That's what the phrase, the seed of Abraham, means in verse 7. The descendant after the flesh. Hmm. Could be one of my sons, brought up in a Christian home, under the gospel. After the flesh, he's taken advantage of all the privileges that a child has, who is brought up in such an environment so close, in such close proximity to the Word of God. But the Jews, Paul says, in several places in the New Testament, had a lot of privileges. They were caretakers of the oracles of God. They were called the chosen people. They were of, of, the, of, of the seed of Abraham. They, they, they were the caretakers of the temple and the tabernacle. They had the service of God. They had all these privileges, but what good did they do them? Without grace, without faith in Jesus Christ, the advantages and privileges actually condemn us in a greater way, do they not? We become more accountable because we know the truth. Right? That's why parents of unsaved children, Christian parents of unsaved children, be diligent to bring your children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord and do not rest upon any covenant 
or any tradition or any teaching that suggests you can be apathetic in delivering the Word of God to your children, in teaching the Word of God to your children, in explaining the Word of God to your children, in applying the Word of God and its meaning to your children's life. When you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, even as adults, never get to the place in your life, which occasionally I hear, I'll hear a, a believing parent of grown children say, well, I've done my job. It's all true. I've taught them. Now they're on their own. Brethren, I look for every opportunity to talk to my children, to have conversations with my children about the Word of God. Whether they're saved ones or not, you never know what the Lord is going to do. His Word will not return unto Him void, but will accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. If you've ceased in family devotions, oh, repent and pick it back up again. Pick it back up again. Bring your family before the Christian altar, as it were. And read the Word of God. And pray together as a family. And not just for that half hour or hour every night, but wherever you go. Relate and define all reality around you in the world according to the standard of the Word of God. As we are taught in Scripture as parents. But... Moving on then, in the second use of the word seed here, there's something different. Here, it is used only in the sense of a person through whom God's covenant with Abraham will be carried on. In that covenant, God promises to continue a special spiritual relationship with himself. The person who is identified with this second seed at the end of verse 8, that is the children of the promise, are counted as the seed. This person, God promises to continue a special spiritual relationship with that he had with Abraham. God is talking about the spiritual seed here. In other words, there's a natural seed and there's a spiritual seed. That's what this text is referring to. Isaac and Ishmael are both the natural seed of Abraham. Right? Isaac and Ishmael came from the body of Abraham. But only Isaac is the promised child. He's of the physical seed, but he's also of the spiritual seed. Ishmael is only of the physical seed of Abraham. But then from verse 9a, all the way down to verse 18, which we're not going to look at today, Paul gives three Old Testament examples of God's sovereignty in election. First, Isaac and Ishmael in verse 7 through 9, then Jacob and Esau, verses 10 through 13, and then Pharaoh in verses 14 through 18, to prove and establish beyond any shadow of a doubt not only that election, both nationally and, corp and individually, is biblical. But it is God, not man, who chooses his elect. Now, the first two, Isaac and Ishmael, and then Jacob and Esau, show that God made a sovereign choice among the physical descendants of Abraham in establishing the spiritual line of promise. Now remember, the promise is connected with the covenant. When God made a covenant with Abraham... In that covenant. And what is a covenant? It's an agreement. It's a pact. When two people came together in the Old Testament, and they made a pact, they made an agreement, they usually sealed it with a meal, they drank together. But God made a pact, a covenant, an agreement with Abraham. And the nature of this covenant was that it is unilateral. It started with God, there was no negotiation and came to Abraham. Abraham no ch had no choice. But it was still a covenant. Abraham had to accept it. God stated the terms of the covenant. Mm. But in the covenant, there's a promise. God made a promise. And he said in that promise that there would be a spiritual seed that would would be would have faith in God 
the same kind of faith that Abraham had in God. And that spiritual seed would be without number, would be greater than the stars of heaven. You remember that passage when God took Abraham out and said, look up into the heavens. It was at night. And he said, count the stars. He said, if you can count them, so shall the number of your seed be. He was primarily referring to the spiritual seed. The innumerable company of the saints that would be of the same faith as Abraham. Amen. And so God makes a sovereign choice among the physical descendants of Abraham in establishing the spiritual line of promise. <clears throat> now notice it says that they are all children of Abraham, nor are they all children of Abraham, because they are the seed of Abraham. He's continuing his line of reasoning from verse 6, saying just because they're of the physical descendants of Abraham doesn't mean that they're children of God. A child of God is defined as someone who has a saving relationship with God himself. He is born from above. He goes on in verse 8 to say that those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. So he makes a distinction between those who may truly be within the orbit and within the orb of the external blessings of the people of God within Old Testament Israel or, for that matter, within the New Covenant Church. But these are not necessarily the children of God. To be a child of God and become part of the spiritual seed of Abraham, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must have the Spirit of God enter you and regenerate you, convert you, make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. But if all you have are the externals, you're not a child of God. You may look like a religious person, you may talk like a religious person, you may act like a Christian, but still not be on the inside. And, and my friend, it's all about the inside with God. Because if He has control and possession of the inside, everything else will follow suit. But then he says in verse 8, continuing, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. The children of the promise, that is when God promised Abraham, look at the stars of heaven, so shall your descendants be. He says, that is the spiritual seed. So, To Abraham was born Ishmael through Hagar in Genesis 16. We read about that. Also, after Hagar, um, Abraham had six sons through Keturah. You remember that? His other wife? Genesis 25, 1 through 4. And so these were the physical descendants of Abraham, but they were not counted as Abraham's spiritual children. In the Greek, it comes from the word techna, born ones, spiritually born ones, in the line of promise. But instead, as God told Abraham again in Genesis 21, it's through Isaac that your offspring, your spiritual offspring, will be reckoned. And Paul repeated the principle here in Romans 9 for emphasis in different words. He's saying it is not the natural children who are God's children. And as parents sometimes we need to remember we tend to give our children the benefit of the doubt when they bow their head as a four-year-old or an eight-year-old or a twelve-year-old or a fifty-year-old and say the sinner's prayer. We, we so much want to have our children get to heaven that we give them the benefit of the doubt. But my Bible teaches me in the doctrine of total depravity, never ever ever give the human heart the benefit of the doubt, because the heart is deceitful above all things, above everything in this world that is deceitful, or can be deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, desperately meaning without hope, no way of recovering. You cannot rehabilitate the heart. You cannot teach the human heart, apart from the grace of God, how to do well and be good. Who can know it? No one can know the human heart. 
How many pastors counsel hundreds and thousands over the duration of their ministry? Who got saved as a child and then went astray and then got saved all over again as a 20 year old, a 30 year old, a 40 year old. And I have to tell such who come to me, brother, you, didn't, you need to consider whether or not you got saved in the first place. Because my Bible teaches you only get saved once. And when you get saved, you cannot lose your salvation. If you can lose your salvation and then get it back again, it's pointing me to the cross and it's making a statement about the cross that Jesus is, is good enough to save you, but not powerful enough to keep you. My Bible teaches that he who saves me will keep me. The work that he started will be completed until the day of Jesus Christ. So, yes, it's okay to be optimistic and to root for your, the spiritual progress of your children. But be careful how far down the road you go with that. Always pull back at a certain point and give your children over to the Lord and plead with the Lord that evidences and fruits and traits of true salvation will emanate from their lives in the coming weeks and months and years after they make a profession of faith. And when you see those fruits of salvation, yes, take pleasure in it, rejoice in it. What a gift! My wife and I often talk about the fact that our lives would be fulfilled. When we hear that all of our children, all five of them, are saved. We can die now. Isn't that true, parents? But be careful if you push them too fast into being saved and persuade them that they are saved. And what five-year-old is going to say, no, I'm not saved, Daddy or Mommy? You may have to unsave them and then get them saved again. That is... Truly saved the right way, God's way. Now, I'm not saying that children don't get saved. Thank God children get saved. And it's our prayer here at Christ Bible Church that every single child in this church gets saved. And we have a proactive approach in this regard, in our intercessory prayers for their salvation. We ought never to rear back on our lazy hind legs and not pray because they're children of the covenant or because we're just neglectful. But just be careful. Be careful in this area. Mm. So, it is not the natural children who are God's children. But it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. That's what the Bible teaches. The spiritual seed. The spiritual offspring. Each one individually must exercise faith for himself or herself in Jesus Christ for salvation. I cannot believe for my children who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. Our children are not born again by blood. They cannot inherit their salvation through their bloodline, through me. They're born of God and God alone by faith in Jesus Christ. To be a physical descendant of Abraham is not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough! One must be chosen by God, and one must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this clearly laid out in Romans 4. Turn with me to Romans 4, verse 12. Romans 4, verse 12. I love my dear Presbyterian brethren. And uh, we are not better than them in any sense of the word. But I'm, I sometimes wonder how they interpret this passage. Those who believe that as long as the children are in the covenant, they'll make it. Romans 4 verse 12, And the father of circumcision, to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Now watch. Abraham was not circumcised when he believed. That's key. There was no covenant in force. 
He believed in God and God counted it as righteousness. God imputed it as righteousness before the covenant. Before he was circumcised, which was a sign and a seal of the covenant, which came, the, the circumcision followed immediately after the covenant was made. So before the covenant was made, Abraham believed, and he had the full salvation at that time. Verse 13, For the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, that is, the physical seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, that is, if salvation can be earned by keeping the law, and they are the heirs of salvation, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who are of the law, that is the Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, the spiritual father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. Another perfect example of why parents must get anything out of their mind that would assist them or convince them that they can do something to help their children believe apart from teaching them the gospel and encouraging them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ by themselves. You see, when did God give a son to Abraham? When he was past the ability to have a child. In other words, the child that was born, Isaac, was a miracle child, was he not? God gave life back into Abraham's body. And the symbol of that life in Isaac is a picture of the new birth being raised from the dead. And that's how everyone is saved. By exercising faith, the same faith as Abraham. We're all saved the same way by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, lastly... Thirdly, election. Three examples. We're only going to look at two today. At this time, verse 9b, Romans 9, 9b, At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. So the first example is Jacob over Esau. And this is uh, the second Old Testament illustration of God's sovereign choice in election. And it's drawn from the second generation of Jewish ancestry. ancestry with the first one was, uh, of course, Isaac and Rebekah were the first generation after Abraham. And then Isaac and Rebekah, of course, and then Jacob and Esau were the children uh, of Isaac and Rebekah. They were the third generation. And God, therefore, purposed to establish this principle at the beginning of his relationship with his chosen people. The principle being that when people are saved, it's by God's sovereign choice. He's the one who decides. They are elected. It has nothing to do with the individuals. They have no cooperation or consultation with God in their election. And this illustration emphasizes, that is the, the, the matter of Jacob over Esau, God's sovereignty even more than the first illustration with Isaac and Rebekah, since it involves God's choice of one twin over another. Now you know Jacob and Esau were twins, and they were wrestling around there inside of uh, 
Rebecca's womb. Not very much room for a wrestling match. But in that wrestling match, God was going to depict a very important thing. He was going to teach a very important lesson. And that lesson is that whoever is born first has the birthright and has the privileges of that birthright. And God, of course, had Esau born first, so he had the privilege, but Jacob was the chosen child of God. So, in the long run, regardless of earthly advantages, it is, it, 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 it is those people who are chosen by God and exercise faith in Jesus Christ that receive salvation. And in the case of Rebekah's children, Jacob and Esau, God's choice was indicated before they were even born, as the text says, or done anything good or bad. This demonstrates that God's sovereign choice was not by works, even works foreseen by God. Salvation was, is not by works. Election is not by works. But as the text says, of him who what? Calls. That's what it says there, doesn't it? They were elected. Jacob was saved regardless of what he did. He was elected in the womb. Had nothing to do with him, his works. As a matter of fact, Jacob was really not a nice guy. Jacob means supplanter or deceiver in Hebrew. Yaakov. He was a rascal before his conversion. Deceiving his brother, stealing the birthright, running away. But God converted him out there. Some, sometime out there. On his way to Uncle Laban's house. So God's purpose and plan in election is not based on man's works. And it is based on his grace alone. He chooses. And we see this as well in the fact that Rebecca was informed in the prophecy in Genesis 25 that the older will serve the younger. That's what happened, wasn't it? God didn't ask Rebecca. He told her, he informed her, the older is going to serve the younger. Why? Because he's the one who elected and ordained and established and predetermined the entire situation. And we see it because there's a divine choice here, confirmed by God's declaration. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Before they were even born or did anything wrong or right, God set his love upon Jacob, and he didn't set his redeeming love upon Esau. That's another way of saying, Jacob have I, or uh, Esau I have hated. It wasn't with a malicious hatred. But it was just the fact that he did not choose Esau. So, those are two examples. Isaac and number two, Jacob and Esau. Next week we'll look at the third example. But let me close then with two applications. Number one. Is the doctrine of election a source of comfort and praise in your life. Because it should be. I'll never forget the first time I heard the doctrine of election as taught in a biblical way, as, as presented in a very scriptural way. I heard about election before that. And some of my buddies in the first church I became a member of said, don't follow after those people who believe in election." They don't, they don't like to evangelize. They're the frozen chosen. So I got prejudiced towards some of my brethren because of this false caricature. But then I, I heard some teaching on a, on a cassette tape back when they had cassette tapes. Remember those? And it, it hit me when I finally understood the doctrine of election. 
as I was driving down the road in my 1973 Olds Cutlass, 21 years old, tears rolling down my cheeks as I heard about the fact that God chose me before the foundation of the world to be his child. In spite of the fact that for the first 21 years of my life, I would hate him, rebel against him, run from him, reject every invitation he sent my way to believe in his son. But his love is so persevering and overcoming that it broke down all my resistance because he chose me before the foundation of the world. And he is going to have his way when it comes to loving me as his child and saving me. And I, I really, my, my understanding of God went from this small to infinitely bigger when I saw that it was he who chose me. I didn't choose him. I made my adoration and wonder of God greater than worship. Do you ever just pray, oh God, I thank you that you chose me. Oh, I thank you, God. You never pray like this. God, I thank you that I helped you when I got to a point in my life and I didn't understand. I, I, I kind of sent a message or I helped you in some way to bring the gospel to me so that I could cooperate with you. In my No, nobody ever prays like that. When we pray, oh God, if you didn't save me, I would be so blind, I'd be in hell right now probably. My life would be cut short. But I thank you that you were so patient and long-suffering with me. Because I was one of your sheep. one of your. I wasn't a goat. There's a difference. A goat can never become a sheep. But a lost sheep can be found and be a saved sheep, right? I was one of those lost sheep, and so were you if you're converted. God watching you wander out the wilderness of sin all your life. Till one day he found you. He left the ninety and nine. He left the sheepfold and sought you out and drew you back to himself with cords of love. Oh, that, that does a lot for our worship, does it not? It does a lot in our, in our praise and thanks to the Lord because of his love. Before I was even created, he chose me, he elected me. He had me in his mind. And he said, this is how Joe Jackowitz is going to be, and this is how I'm going to save him. He says that the very hairs of my head are all numbered. He knows all about me. And he set his love upon me. That is, he foreknew me. He loved me beforehand. Oh, my brother, my sister, when you read about the doctrine of election, let's pause and stare up at heaven in our mind's eye and let's praise God and give Him glory for choosing us or else we would have never chosen Him. That's what Jesus said, wasn't it? You did not cho choose me, but I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. John 15. Secondly, and lastly, if you are lost, if you are not saved yet, The doctrine of election is designed to inspire you to surrender your life to Christ. Did you know that? You say, but wait a minute. If I'm not saved yet, then how do I know I'm ever going to get saved? As a matter of fact, it may suggest that I'll never get saved because I'm not saved yet. After all these sermons I've heard, after all the pleadings of my parents, all the tears that have been shed in prayer for my salvation, here I am, still lost. But let me ask you a question. Do you want to be saved? Well, yeah, I want to be saved. Do you know you're a sinner on your way to hell? Oh, yeah. There's nobody worse than me as a sinner. Do you want to know and experience that joy and peace and love that the Bible, that the Gospel promises all those who repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, yes, there's nothing I want more than that. Well, that's a good indication that you, you are one of the elect and you are on your way to be saved because nobody desires those things and enjoys those things and relishes in those things except the elect. 
That's what my Bible teaches. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And when they are presented with all the glorious truths of the gospel, they can't relate to it. They can't appreciate it. They love darkness rather than light. And even though you're not converted yet, God is planting seeds of hunger and thirst for His righteousness in your heart. And though you're not there yet, you're on your way. That's a good sign that you are one of the elect. So call upon the Lord and don't worry about the process. Don't be analytical about how God is going to save you. Just fix your faith on Jesus Christ and trust in Him. And when you do, He'll take care of the rest too. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for electing me and your people. We do praise you and thank you for choosing us to be your children before the foundation of the world. Who are we and what is this people that you would choose us and set us apart to be your special treasure, your royal priesthood, the, the delighted ones after your heart, the apple of your eye. Who are we, Lord? Oh, we are not worthy of the least of your mercies and your love, but we thank you and praise you nonetheless that you love us in spite of ourselves. And you've chosen us to be your people. And we pray for those who are wrestling hard with sin, who are hungering and thirsting for your righteousness, but they're not saved yet. Oh, we pray that you would give them a new heart. Take away the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Circumcise their hearts, Lord. Grant them saving faith in Christ, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.